issue is made possible by the support from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, the Ministry of Education and Culture of the Republic of Indonesia, and the Indonesian Restaurant Association in Sydney. This talk show is live streamed in Budaya Maju YouTube, Ministry of Education and Culture. My name is Trisari Diah Paramita, Consul for Economic Affairs at the Indonesian Consulate General in Sydney, and I'm your MC for the day. Thank you for your participation and a very warm welcome to our speakers, Consul General of Indonesia in Sydney, Mr. Heru Hartanto Subolo, Director General for Culture, His Excellency Mr. Hilmar Farid, Director for East Asia and Pacific, Dr. Santo Darmo Sumarto, who will be joining us later. Director for Utilization and Development for Culture, Mr. Restu Gunawan. Chef William Wongso, Indonesia Gastronomy Network. Chef Harjo, Board Committee of IRA Sydney. Mr. Ian Burnett, author of Spice Islands. And our facilitators, Mrs. Vita Datau and Mr. Arif Atman. Some of the housekeeping information for today. Participants, kindly mute your microphone during the talk show. Should you have any questions, kindly write down your name, organization, and to whom your questions are posed. Ask your question in the Q&A, and the moderator will convey your questions to the speakers. Please fill in the attendance form that will be shared in the chat by the committee. The talk show will be opened by a welcoming remark from Consul General of Indonesia in Sydney, followed by a keynote speech from the Director General for Culture of Ministry of Education and Culture, His Excellency Mr. Hilmar Farid. After this keynote speech, we will begin the first session, which will discuss on Spice Root Journey. Families are Mr. Ian Burnett, author of Spice Islands, and Mr. Restu Gunawan, Director for Utilization and Development of Culture, Ministry of Education and Culture. This session will be facilitated by Mrs. Vita Datau, Chief Communication Officer, Jalur Rempah. The second session will discuss on Indonesia Spice Up the World with panelists Chef William Wongso from Indonesia Gastronomy Network and Chef Harjo from Indonesian Restaurant Association in Sydney and owner of Pedan Chia Restaurant. This session will be facilitated by Mr. Arif Atnam, Deputy Director for Australia and Oceania, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Republic of Indonesia. Each session will last for 45 minutes, which each panelist have 15 minutes to elaborate their materials and 15 minutes for Q&A. At the end of the talk show, we will hear a closing remark from the Director for East Asia and Pacific Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Mr. Da Santo Darmo Sumarto. Now, I would like to invite the Consul General of the Republic of Indonesia in Sydney, covering New South Wales, Queensland, and South Australia, Mr. Heru Hartanto Subolo, to deliver his welcoming remark. Mr. Subolo is a seasoned diplomat. His posts abroad are the Indonesian Embassy in Washington, D.C. and Oslo, and the Indonesian Consulate General in Houston. Consul General, the screen is yours. <laughs> Thank you so much, Ibu Shari. Uh, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, good afternoon uh, to my colleague in uh, Australia. Uh, good morning uh, in Indonesia. Allow me first to greet the uh, distinguished uh, uh, guests and, uh, and also uh, uh, panelists uh, this afternoon. Uh, Bapak uh, Hilmar Farid, uh, Director General for Cultures, Ministry of Education and Cultures. Uh, sahabat saya, Pak Santo Darmo Sumarto, uh, Director for uh, East Asia and Pacific, MOFA Indonesia, that will be joining with us uh, later. And then Pak Arstu Gunawan, uh, Director for Utilization and Development of Cultures, Ministry of Education and Cultures. Uh, my good friend, Pak Ian Burnett, a friend of Indonesia and also author of uh, Spice Island. Thank you so much for joining with us, Pak. Ibu Vita Dato. Chief Communication uh, Officer of the Indonesian Spice Route, uh, Chef William Wongso, the legendary uh, Indonesian Gastronomy Network, uh, Chef Harjo, my good friend in Sydney. Uh, he's not only a committee member of the Indonesian Restaurant Association in Sydney, but also the owner of uh, Medan Jia Sydney, uh, a great restaurant in, in Sydney. And also distinguished uh, participant, ladies and gentlemen, uh, it is my great pleasure uh, to welcome you all uh, to this very first talk show in Australia on the Spice Route. 
But before that, I should like to begin uh, by thanking the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, all the team of uh, Director uh, of uh, East and Asia uh, uh, region of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Education and Culture of the Republic of Indonesia, as well as uh, the Indonesian uh, Restaurant Association, IRA, in Sydney, for their support uh, in making this, uh, this talk show uh, possible. Uh, this talk show is a kick-off event uh, from series of events that will be organized by the Consulate General of Indonesia in Sydney to raise awareness of the importance of Indonesian spices, not only in culinary, but also in history. In the series of events will support the Indonesian government and its efforts to rebuilding its spice route and to promoting Indonesian cuisine in Australia through Spice Up the World program. As the Consul General of Indonesia in Sydney, covering in, in New South Wales, Queensland, and South Australia, I'm blessed with many key success factors in supporting the Indonesian government effort in this context. First and foremost, uh, ever stronger relation between Indonesia and Australia with the visit of President Joko Widodo uh, last February in Australia, and also the entry into force, the Indonesia-Australia Comprehensive Economic Partnership, IASIPA agreement, and the signing of the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership this month. Every year, more than 1 million tourists from Australia visit Indonesia. And there are more than 40,000 Indonesian diaspora in my jurisdiction, around 70 Indonesian restaurants also, not, on, uh, not including other food businesses, and also Indonesian studies in several universities in Australia. Spices importers, Indonesian Restaurant Association, and many friends of Indonesia who enrich any study on Indonesia and Australia. Participants, uh, history record that Indonesia is one of the biggest spices producing country in the world. But how many of us know that Indonesia's spice route has shaped the world map? You may have read in many literatures that in the past, the spice route herald spice trade by Indonesian ancestors around the world it has indirectly formed a nation through a cultural assimilation. You may also heard that nutmeg in Banda Island, in Molucas, and cloves in Ternate, not Molucas, have contributed to the world civilization. How is it possible? And what is the importance to reviving this now and bring it to the current context? Those are the questions that will be answered during the first session of this talk show today. We have the privilege of having one of friend of Indonesia in Sydney, who is also historian and voyagers, Bapak Ian Burnet. Thank you so much for joining with me. Among us today to deliver their great story of great civilization of Indonesia and, special, and especially the spices. He has been traveling around Indonesia for 30 years, organized selling voyages around Spice Island in Bugis, Spinisi, and also wrote a book on Spice Island. The kind of schooners, which is built entirely from the timber in southern beaches of Sulawesi, once traveled as far as Northern Australia in 1700s. And Makassan, uh, traded with Australia indigenous on three pang commodity. Mr. Ian Burnett uh, would, satisfy, would satisfy our curios curiosity on the historical aspect of Indonesian spice and also its relation to the world civilization. Along with Mr. Ian Burnett, we have Indonesian historian, Bapak Arastu Gunawan, who can also share with us on how Indonesia revives its spice route leading up to the acknowledgement by UNESCO World Heritage Committee. Reviving this spice route is also believed to have a significant contribution 
to the economy, particularly local communities and spices related industries, including herbal medicine and tourism. Participant, uh, reviving a spice route, which occurred thousand years, a thousand years ago, a text a journey his Excellency Mr. Uh, Hilman Farid, Director General for Culture and the Ministry of Education and Culture, is the lead in this journey. We will hear more uh, from him in a minute. So please bear with me because discussing spices without culinary would be incomplete. I'm pleased also to share with you that we will also hear from the legend in Indonesian gastronomy, Chef William Wongso. He once said that we have to understand our food, not through the taste, but through our food culture. He believed that if we introduce food culture to foreigners, they will become much more absorbed. How he does it through Indonesian spice up the world. How to adapt Indonesian ingredient to local flavor in this context in Australia. And how Indonesian restaurant in Australia, such as Medancia in Sydney, could support on this journey. Those intriguing, intriguing uh, questions will be answered during the second session of this talk show. I hope all of this will serve as a teaser for every participant joining this talk show. Stay with us for the next two hours and tell me if you are not intrigued by the discussions. Next program, we will have a masterclass on Indonesian food business in Australia. And this event will be held next Monday on the 30th of November, 2020, virtually and streamed in the YouTube channel of the Indonesian Consulate General in Sydney. So thank you, sit back and relax, enjoy the talk show. And I gave the screen over to the MC. Terima kasih. Thank you, Consul General. Now I would like to invite Director General for Culture from the Ministry of Education and Culture, His Excellency Mr. Hilmar Farid, to deliver his keynote speech. Mr. Hilmar Farid assumed his post as Director General for Culture in 2015. Born in Bonn, Germany, he received his doctoral degree from the National University of Singapore. He is known as historian and lecturer. His office, like Pa Konjen said, is in the process of collecting historical data to support the Indonesian government effort to get the Indonesian spice route recognized by UNESCO World Heritage Committee. Excellency, the screen is yours. Still muted, sorry. Um, thank you very much. Uh, selamat pagi dan selamat siang. Uh, very good morning to all of you and also good uh, afternoon for those who are in uh, Sydney, Australia. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, particularly the General Consulate in Sydney, and its head, Pak Heru, for organizing this event. It is an important event as it extends our conversation about the Spice Route, which has been pretty much focused to the Indian Ocean. Uh, but now we are directing it to Australia and the Pacific. And of course, I'm looking forward to hearing more from our excellent set of speakers. We have Pak uh, William Bongso, Chef William Bongso, <coughs> Chef Arjo, Ian Burnett, uh, Vita Datau, and our own Pak Restu Gunawan, uh, and Pak Santo uh, of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. Um, and we will discuss not only cultural features and historical facts, but also a look into the possibilities uh, for the future. Indonesia, as we know, is the largest archipelago in the world, with around 17,000 islands across uh, 3,200 miles along the equator, and a population of 267 million people, which is composed of no less than 1,100 ethnic groups speaking hundreds of different languages. It is an archipelago in the truest sense, an area where the sea is remarkable for its large number of islands. The late Professor Adrian Lapian summed it up in a beautiful phrase. It is an ocean sprinkled with islands. Sebuah samudra yang ditaburi pulau-pulau. Waves of migration has brought different civilizations to the archipelago, many of which have traveled by sea. Historians have been able to trace back ancient naval technologies to the fifth millennium before common era. Sailors of the archipelago have been roaming the seas as far as Madagascar to the west and Polynesia to the east since uh, 
1,000 before um, Common Era. Uh, their journeys have formed a complex web of connections involving exchange and assimilation of language, technology, knowledge, and arts. These networks of exchange evolve into collectivities, determined as much by economic, social, and cultural processes as by the different sea systems. Um, to understand the sea systems, um, if the topographical nature determines the form of our road network, then the sea systems determines the sea routes or corridors for ships. And spices have been an important, if not essential, part of this network, network of exchanges. The most popular spices have been nutmegs and cloves, um, which uh, Heru has mentioned earlier before. And in the 16th century, uh, the spices had become so popular that Europeans then decided to cross the Indian Ocean and find the sources of these spices themselves. Their journey and subsequent conquest of the sources marked the beginning of a painful era in our history, colonialism. Colonialism pushed the indigenous maritime network into the background and history then was rewritten. The Spice Root Program, initiated by the Ministry of Education and Culture in 2016, is an attempt to revive the story of this indigenous maritime network. And along with that, the various knowledge systems, cultural expressions, cultural practices embedded the, uh, within the network. And this is of course not an entirely new endeavor. Historians have been writing about the spice roots for many years, even for decades. And I think that Ian Burdett here is one of them. And what we do through the spice root program is to synthesize previous findings and initiate new research that based on on these findings. Um, and the Spice Root Program uh, is much more than an academic uh, exercise. It is also aimed to enhance our understanding of ourselves, our history, our identity. While it is true that the Indonesian nation and the state is a modern invention, it is equally true that the complex networks along the Spice Route have, give, have given the people a sense of connection to each other. And this was best exemplified by the widespread use of Malay in the archipelago for centuries. So what does the spice route mean for us today? We live currently in an age of uncertainty. And if uh, Sir John Kenneth Galbraith, the economist, made that conclusion about our global economy more than 40 years ago, then today we need to add climate change, great possibility of other diseases um, to the equation. Uh, but there's one certainty that the old ways of doing things is no longer possible. Hence the talk about a new normal. A few weeks ago, I came across an interesting book entitled Beyond Great by expert of the Boston Consulting Group. It's, it's a large management consulting firm, um, which is basically part of the economic establishment. And the interesting claim of that book is that being great is no longer good enough. And it advises basically corporations to grow deeply local rather than depending on their skill to win globally. So uh, here, uh, it basically claims that a better understanding of local realities is essential. And if we push this argument a little bit further, uh, it is possible that the networks of small localities might be essential in our imagination um, of, uh, for the new normal. And this is exactly what we are trying to do through the Spice Root Program. To understand local realities, both historical and present, to identify the potentials at the local level, and to engage local practitioners and other stakeholders. So the Spice Route is much more than history. It is about us today and our future. Thank you. Thank you, Excellency, for setting the tone for this talk show. Uh, I was informed that uh, your Excellency has to leave the talk show because uh, he has another uh, meeting to um, um, to attend. So, participant Excellency Hilmar Farid will have to leave the screen due to another for meeting. Yeah. On behalf of the committee, I would like to once again thank him for his support and his presence to this talk show. Thank you. Terima kasih, Pak Hilmar Farid. Terima kasih, Pak Dijen. Now it's time for me to give the screen over to Mrs. Vita Datau to facilitate the first session on Spice Root Journey. Mrs. Vita Datau is currently the Chief Communication Officer of Jalur Rempah and Chair of Gastronomy, Culture and Tourism at Indonesia Gastronomy Network. 
She has been involved and represent Indonesia in International Gastronomy Forum, including UNWTO, World Forum on Gastronomy Tourism, and ASEAN Gastronomy Forum. This is Vita Datau. The screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Ms. Sari. A very good morning and uh, God bless for everyone, uh, panelists and participants uh, of the Spice Road Journey webinar. Uh, I'm very pleased to become the facilitator in the first session, which is we have uh, two excellent panelists or speakers, uh, and each speaker will uh, speak about 15 minutes. So uh, to... I believe that the Director General is give a very clear, loud, clear, very crystal clear uh, direction regarding what is a pro, uh, program about. However, we have pa, uh, Dr. Restu Gunawan uh, as a first speaker. Uh, we'll talk, we'll explain about uh, this program and then how this is uh, can be implemented what is the spice road is and how do we plan to bring the spice road to the current context and also what is the Indonesian government program related to the spice road. Dr. Restu Gunawan is the Director of Cultural Development and Utilization, Director General of Culture, the Ministry of Education and Culture, the Republic of Indonesia. And he has extensive experience in the cultural diplomacy. He's also actively involved in the Indonesian historian community. And he has written many articles and journals. Among the books he uh, uh, are is the Encyclopedia Tokoh Kebudayaan Nasional, Ternate Bandar Jalur Sutra, and Sejarah Pemikiran Indonesia. And he is also the lead of the uh, special task force for the Spice Road Program in the Ministry of education and culture. Without further ado, I would like to invite our first speakers. So, Dr. Restu Gunawan, the screen is yours. Terima kasih, Bu Vita. Thank you, Bu Vita. Can you uh, share screen? Okay. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Very good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Respectable. Uh, sebentar. Oke. Okay. Uh, Oke. Okay. Uh, hmm. Oke. Okay. <coughs> Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Good morning. Thank you, Bu Vita. Ladies and gentlemen, respectable all speaker and participant of the conference, my great appreciation to Pak Heru Subolo, uh, Mr. Consul General, and all stakeholder who have succeeded this program. I'm very glad to meet Mr. Jan Burnett, the author of an important book entitled Spice Island, and then Pak William Wongso and the all participant. The global Space, spice trade in Asia via the Indian Ocean has left a great civilization trace. This maritime route has made a significant contribution as a mean of culture exchange and intercultural understanding that bring together various ideas, concept, knowledge, and experience between people across nation. This picture, this picture show a boat on Nil River as as painted in a wall from the tomb of Snever or Luxor 1426 to 1400 BC. The vessel fragile contraction suggests that the land from which ancient Egypt obtains spices may not have been particularly remote. The boot rest portrait on this black figure, a cup of 520 to 510 BC indicated the limitation of ancient grid shipping, cargo space, even for spices, was at premium. Spices as a commodity have been used maybe even before Greece. Of course, to prove this claim, comprehensive research is needed involving various scientific disciplines. 
based on various good report from the explorer of China, India, and even the Middle East spices on their way have crossed various ocean and region before reaching the Middle East and Europe. Apart from that, is apart from that, it should be noted that spices in the journey are not only one way, one way west, but also to east and to south. Thus, the spice trade road has led to the development of various sciences and culture, which are not only a cultural heritage for Indonesia, but also a cultural heritage for the world because of its strategic geopolitical and geoeconomic position and list between two continents and two oceans. Indonesia is a global meeting point. The ELA of Indianization, Sylvain, Sylvain Levy says that the periodic cycle of current and wind cycle that determines shipping has long sustained to trading system with, between the African coast, the Arabian Peninsula, the Persian Gulf, India, and Indonesian archipelago. The Ramayana book written by Walmiki in the 4th century BC and the Jataka book have mentioned the relationship between India and the Indonesian archipelago. In the book, it was written names such of Java Dwipa, or Java and Swarna Dwipa, Sumatra, who were the source of gold and spices. Some scholars think that the shirt Search for gold was an important motive for Indian go to Southeast Asia. Early Indian texts mentioned that agarwood or gaharu and sandalwood chandana came from foreign countries, namely Southeast Asia. It was possibly from the Eastern Archipelago and brought to the West, then to India. Indian traders obtained cloth lavanga from Dwi Pantara, other island. This is also said by Kalidasa, who lived in the fourth century. Now the source about cloth is also written by Chara, Chara Katabib King Kaniskadari Kusan in the first century or second century. The Western archipelago was famous for paper. One of the medicinal herbs using long paper was studied by physician from Greece before Iskandar Sulkarnain expedition to North India. Many drugs prescription were written in the Susruta and Charaka books. In Sutra book about the 12th level of Buddha made by Kaludaka in 3092 AD that Raja Seya or Java had long paper and black paper. Among Indonesian paper, the tile paper appears most frequently in Indian trade. In the writing of Chen Shangchi, the author of 8th century medical material. This type of paper grow in Sriwijaya or Fossi. It is, it is also important that Kampur or Kapur Barus in the Jataka and Ramayana book was said to be a medicine for oral disease. The Kampur trees do not grow in India. In India, this archipelago plant is referred to as Karpura. And then sailing to East. The situation of sailing to is especially to China developing in the early 5th century was described by the two travelers Fasian and Gunafarman. Fasian first traveled from Sri Lanka to China in 413 AD by sea. Fasian sailed in May from Yeboti, Java Dwipa or Java in the archipelago to China. Gunafarman returned to China from the Indian Ocean via the same road. In the third century, China trade to Southeast Asia via Funan. The trade spices was believed to be Jinshi. The initial name used was Ting Xiang or Clove, Chengke. In more modern time, Cosmas India Coplastas, who wrote in the middle of the sixth century, explained that Clove reached Sri Lanka from a country far for the east. Apart from an important commodity is agarwood or gaharu. Gaharu is believed to be a medicine to prolong life for Taoists during the period 2081 to 341. 
AD. Kaharusep, Kaharusep is a miracle drug to prolong, prolong the life of a person who is sick. It also can treat illness such as ulcers and heart illness, liver illness, spleen illness, lung illness, and kidney illness. Gaharu at the time was only obtained from Sumatra. The uniqueness of the pre-colonial spice trade, although it was a long journey, there was mutual respect between the foreigner and the native. They did not conquer each other, but strength each other culture. This was changed when colonialism entered the trading system with desire to dominate and colonize. This was done by the European with their sizable troop and fleets. At a very pot crossing point, spices and court cultural exchange both, both in the form of adaptation and acculturation. This form and cultural exchange took the form of food, fashion, traditional technology, custom and ritual, belief, and so on. So the spice commodity has actually encouraged the imagine a new culture. So best on the long history of spice, Indonesia tries to propose spice road as world culture heritage in the category of culture road. According to the International Council of Monument and Site ICOMOS, for the proposed culture road, the road of communication between culture, whether on, on land, water, and or other type, with is physically limited and is also characterized by the presence of specific dynamic and historical function to achieve specific and well-defined goal must be meet the following requirement. It must emerge from and re reflect the interactive movement of people and the multi-dimensional multi sustainable and reciprocal exchange a good ideas, knowledge, and value between communities, countries, region, or continent over a significant period of time. Therefore, it must promote the cross-cutting of culture effective in time and space as re reflected in their material and intangible heritage. It must be integrated into a dynamic system with historical relationship and cultural object associated, associated with the, it existence. Cultural roads can be classified as follow: area cover, local, national, regional, continent, continental, or intercontinental. And then culture, cultural scope, purpose and function, duration, structural configuration, and natural environment. So the Indonesian Ministry of Education and Culture seek to promote the spice road through sustainable effort involving various elements of society. The spice road is being revived as a collective memory. This effort is carried out by providing education to the public about several things, including the position of spices as unifying force in shaping the development of civilization in the archipelago and even the world. The archipelago is important note of intercultural knowledge exchange that bring together various ideas, knowledge, religions, language, and even custom for century. In addition, it also fills the nation maritime and maritime image which has long been empty with the past glory of the archipelago as an international player in maritime trade and politics because of maritime power. In 2020, several efforts have been initiated, including conducting discussion various studies to generate collective memory about spices as an important Indonesian commodity long before the arrival of the colonial era. In addition, it also seeks to include the spice road as a world cultural heritage. For the part category, there are several things that must be done, as this is different from proposing a cultural heritage. There, this are some activities that already implemented, such as competition, uh, comic, and then animation, and then discussion, discussion, seminar, and workshop in order to 
socialize, socialize spice road to create awareness in the societal and millennial. For the reason, more concrete action plan is needed on how to develop and utilize this spices and spices road as a cultural force related to various other aspects for tourism, creative economy, agriculture, culture, cultural diplomacy, health, and other aspects. The broad aspect and involvement of related parties make the spice road have a, to be seen as a joint movement to strengthen the Indonesian cultural ecosystem. We know, for exam example, China with Silk Road, which has been recognized as a few heritage in the past few years. They are able to make Silk Road a new tagline in development, one belt, one road, even by laying a fairly strong foundation on the Silk Road for the development of culture diplomacy politics abroad. This is a pretty good example for of where culture is the basis for its development. Meanwhile, our spices with eggs and road that is white as the Silk Road have not been able to make it a cultural and economic movement. It is still limited to small a sector that very limited and have not yet become a force that capable to driving a sustainable cultural ecosystem. In the effort to strengthen the narrative on the Spice Road cultural caravan that cross various ports, both domestically and abroad, are being initiated starting in 2021. Insya Allah, pandemi is go. And then cultural caravan will involve cultural artists and related stakeholders in each port road. A festival will be held involving local communities and foreigner by presenting performing art, culinary delights, traditional knowledge, and various cultural aspects that support the advancement of culture. Therefore, through this forum, I would like to invite all of us to put down this legacy through the exchange of knowledge and understanding between culture and at the same time, increasing multiculturalism through the Spice Road as one of the world cultural, cultural, cultural and natural heritage that is still relevant today. Thank you. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Thank you so much, Pak Restu Gunawan. I think uh, the explanation is, is also uh, clear, which is uh, uh, back uh, back to the history, but how to bring the history to become the relevant in this uh, era, and also uh, how the the main spice commodity is uh, in the history also uh, influenced uh, by the 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 existences of the kingdoms in Indonesia, and now we're talking about the how spice utilization not only for the health and medication but also will be uh, applicable to other industries and the 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 essence of uh, of uh, the explanation uh, from Parastu Gunawan is the how we can really support this uh, program through the big uh, real activation hopefully it will be in the 2020 ya pak ya if the the pandemic is a uh, uh, is handling very well. So uh, there is a cultural voyage and this is the real activation that can be connect all the cultural and also we can do a lot of cultural exchange. That's the part of the reconstruction of the Spice Road program. Thank you, Parastu. So now I'm going to move to the second speaker. We have Mr. Ian Burnett. He's the author and historian uh, lovers and uh, voyager. The most important thing that he has so many experience uh, organized sailing voyage around Spice Island since 2012 up to 2017. For those interested in exploring the Eastern Archipelago, sailing with the traditional Indonesian wooden schooner or Bugis Finisi. If we relate it to this, as we know that the Director General uh, 
mention about how important the C system are. Uh, that's that's uh, what we have to talk about because instead of Indonesia having 17,000 island, but Indonesian, this is what what really really uh, interesting to to say that uh, the oceans sparkle or sprinkle of the island. So means that we have to focus on the sea system uh, as a corridor of the spice road. So Mr. Ian Burnett is also graduate with a degree in geology and geophysics from the University of Melbourne. And then he first went to work in Indonesia in 1968 as a young geologist. He spent 30 years living and working and traveling in Indonesia. Definitely, that's make Mr. Ian Burnett in love with Indonesia, including the Spice uh, Islands. So the Spice Islands book was published in the 2011 and tell the history, romance, and adventure of the space trade over 2,000 years. So without further ado, I would like to invite the second speaker, Mr. Ian Burnett, the screen is yours. Thank you, uh, Ibu Vita, and uh, thank you to the, uh, the Ministry of Education and Culture and also to the uh, Consul General in, in, in Sydney for uh, the invitation to uh, speak today. And hello to my colleagues, uh, Restu Gunawan and William Wongso for also participating in this, uh, in this webinar today as well as, as well as the other participants. Um, I'll share my screen. Let me just do that. And slideshow. All right, I hope everybody can see that. Um, this is just the cover of the book Spice Islands, which as you, Ibu Vita said, came out in 2011. Um, a wonderful image of the islands of Tadore taken from uh, the island of Tanate. And then you can see the islands specifically there in the, in the corner. Um, and separated by a narrow strait, only a few kilometers apart. So the images I'll show today is part of the research that I've done, I did for that book and for other subsequent uh, work as well. So we'll just go on to the next, uh, the next image. There we go. Um, so similar to what uh, Restu Guna one shows, this is the spice routes from uh, Eastern Indonesia or the Moluccas uh, across the rest of the world. Spice routes that began way back uh, in BC times with the, uh, the movement of these special spices, um, cloves and nutmeg, which only grew on a few tiny islands in what was then a remote and uh, almost unknown part of the world for, for many people, especially the, uh, the Europeans. So you can see there the, uh, the cinnamon root uh, the main spice route, and then the, uh, the Silk Road above that. So Restu Gunanawan showed images from, from Egypt of spices that reached there, especially um, cinnamon from Indonesia. And uh, so that route is shown on the map across to Madagascar and then up the east coast of, uh, of Africa and then on into the... Uh, the Red Sea and to Egypt. So that's probably the oldest route. Um, certainly, um, as far as Madagascar is concerned, the people there speak Indonesian or an early form of Indonesian known as Austronesian. And certainly the using DNA analysis, the, uh, the uh, people there date from at least uh, at least uh, before 400, uh, 400 AD. 
So there's been a long period of, uh, of transportation, migration, and trading across that uh, the route directly across the uh, the Indian Ocean. Now the route from uh, from the Lukus to uh, to China and the Silk Road uh, was also a uh, had a lot of uh, went back into antiquity, and we know from the annals of the uh, of the um, Han Dynasty that around 200 BC, no one could approach the uh, the Han Emperor without chewing on a uh, a clove a clove bud. So this was a an early form of, of breath freshener, and uh, no one with bad breath was allowed to uh, to approach the emperor. So we know that uh, that route at least goes back as far as 200 BC or earlier. But subsequently, the main uh, spice route from uh, from Indonesia to the rest of the world uh, was along what's here indicated as the the spice route where spices were bought from uh, from these eastern islands along the north coast of Java to Malacca by the uh, Indonesian traders. And um, Malacca at that time was the regional entrepot for all goods coming from Southeast Asia and also from the rest of Asia. From there, um, Indian traders would bring the spices to Calicut or other ports in India where they would be then taken uh, also uh, Gujarat, Gujar the uh, port of Gujar Gujarat, uh, from where they would be taken on two different routes into the Arabian Peninsula. One, of course, uh, mainly by Persian traders up into the Persian Gulf and then across the Arabian Peninsula by camel to the Mediterranean. And the other route uh, by Arab traders into uh, the Red Sea and uh, the port of uh, Jeddah, and then from um, uh, Medina up along the coast of the or the east coast to uh, finally to um, the port of Gaza, or else uh, on the west coast of the Red Sea to uh, across to the Nile by camel, and then down the Nile to the port of Alexandria, where um, all these spices would then be taken mainly by Venetian traders um, from across the, uh, the Mediterranean into Venus, which then became the main distri point, distribution point for, uh, for spices into, uh, into Europe. So the next slide. Well, yes, so the question is, how were these spices transported by uh, Indonesian or Austronesian traders? And we're lucky to have this image from the uh, from the Temple of Borobudur, or the Monument of Borobudur in central Java, which dates from the eighth century. And here you can see a typical ship of that period uh, with a, um, a mast, sails, uh, outriggers, and uh, manned, of course, by these sailors who would have bought the spices across to uh, East Africa, uh, up to China, and also on to, uh, to Malacca and, and India. So certainly, uh, you know, these were the, the ship, sort of ships that would have traded across the, uh, the Eastern seas, uh, bringing this uh, valuable trade. And uh, as Pakaresto mentioned, as they came back from India, they would have bought uh, Indian cultures, so we're talking about uh, Hinduism and Buddhism. And also uh, we know that the Indians are fascinated by gold. Uh, there are no gold mines in, Indonesia, in India, but certainly at that time there were gold mines in Indonesia in both Sumatra, Java and uh, Kalimantan. So um, there was this exchange of culture, of language, religions, uh, architecture, spices and also gold as well as um, the sandalwood that uh, Pat Restu mentioned. Now Arab traders were also involved and here we have an image 
of an Arab trading ship from uh, from that period. So you can see, uh, if you look closely, you can see in the, the windows there, the traders looking nervously out to sea as they uh, were hoping their goods would uh, would reach landfall in India or Indonesia or wherever, wherever they were sailing. And of course, the uh, the captain and the crew working the sails up on the on the deck. So uh, um, we have Indonesian traders, we have Arab traders, and we have uh, Indian traders uh, working this uh, this spice route. Now, of course, these spices were extremely valuable when they reached uh, Europe and were said to be worth their weight in gold uh, because of the long journey they'd taken halfway around the world. And of course, um, the amount of spice that will be lost on that journey. So you can imagine if say a thousand or a hundred kilograms of spice left uh, Maluku, by the time taxes were paid, uh, commissions were paid, um, some of the, the trade was lost to pirates or to uh, to uh, sinking at sea. But out of 100 kilograms, maybe only one kilogram would eventually arrive in Europe, which gives you an idea of how these spices uh, became so valuable. But the Europeans, especially the uh, first the Portuguese and then the Spanish, and subsequently the Dutch and the English, were jealous of this trade and anxious to uh, see if they could participate. So we'll turn from these early um, in Indonesian, Chinese, Indian, and Arab traders to the uh, to the Europeans. So the um, the Portuguese um, on the Iberian Peninsula faced onto the, um, the the Atlantic. They were oceanic sailors, and eventually found their way around the Cape of Good Hope to uh, to India, and then to Malacca, where uh, most of the spices coming from Indonesia would have made their first landfall. So uh, the Portuguese captured Malacca in 1511, and they said that uh, the lords of Malacca had their hands on the throat of Venice. In other words, from Malacca, they could control the spice trade um, across the Indian Ocean and around the Cape of Good Hope into Europe. This also meant that um, spices which had crossed the Arabian Peninsula by camel uh, in sort of small, uh, relatively small amounts or traveled over the Silk Road again in small amounts could now be um, <coughs> carried uh, in ships around the Cape of Good Hope in relatively large quantities uh, and into Europe. Now from uh, Malacca, the Portuguese found their way directly to the Spice Islands uh, in 1512, to both um, the Banda Islands, which was the source of the only nutmeg in the world, and to Ternate and Tadore, which was the source of the only cloves in the world. And let's look at the next image there. Okay, so... Um, so then the Portuguese bought the they bought those spices all the way back from uh, eastern Indonesia around the Cape of, Cape of Good Hope to Lisbon, and then they were distributed uh, across Europe. Now, Pahiro mentioned that uh, the spice trade uh, and Indonesia was instrumental in mapping the world, and uh, this is something to be uh, to celebrate to be celebrated. So this uh, from uh, a, map, a world map from 1519, uh, made by the Portuguese. So you can see, uh, you can see my, yeah, so, uh, whoops, sorry. So we can see uh, Europe and Africa there, and uh, India, uh, Asia, and uh, parts of China. The Malay, the Malay Peninsula, uh, Sumatra, Java, and then the islands of eastern Indonesia, which are 
lesser known and, and relatively poorly mapped. On the, uh, the eastern side of that map, on the western side is the uh, is uh, the Americas, uh, parts of North America, uh, the Caribbean, and uh, South America, including Brazil, which had become Portuguese territory. And then around the bottom, the uh, unknown land or un unknown continent of the uh, of the Great South Land. So in 1519, um, the Portuguese were the only ones who'd sailed the Indian Ocean. And this was the map of the world as known at that time. Now, the Spanish also had, uh, uh, were also on the, uh, the Iberian Peninsula, were jealous of the Portuguese, jealous of the control of the trade also by the, uh, by the, uh, the Muslims and uh, the, uh, the uh, Arabs and thought if they could sail, sail around South America and reach the Spice Islands from another direction, then they could uh, could capture this trade. Mr. Ayer, sorry. Mr. Ayer sorry. can we sum up in three minutes, please? Sure. Thank you. So in uh, 1519, um, a Spanish voyage led by Ferdinand, Ferdinand Magellan set off with an armada, which was called the Armada to Moluccas. So the Moluccas is certainly a very old term and dates all that way back to find their way around South America and reach the Spice Islands. Um, so not only did they reach the Spice Islands, but they also uh, managed to achieve the first circumnavigation of the world. So this map shows the route from Spain around South America, uh, sailing across the Pacific for the first time to reach the Spice Islands. And then of the five vessels that left, one vessel, the Victoria, uh, was able to return to Spain. And uh, on the island of Tidore is this memorial set by the, uh, by the Spanish Navy, a memorial in both uh, Indonesian, Spanish and English to commemorate that, uh, well, the greatest voyage in maritime history, the very first circumnavigation of the world. Uh, so in 14, 1575, the, uh, the Portuguese captured uh, Fort Gamalama on Ternate and the Portuguese surrendered to the Sultan. And so the, uh, the spice trade was again captured by uh, Indonesia um, for a period of, of years until uh, 1606, when we have the arrival of the Dutch. And I'll, uh, I'll uh, finish with this slide, which shows the Asian and Dutch ships that anchor off Fort Batavia uh, in 1649. Uh, in the background, you can see the uh, the Chilowin River, uh, Fort Batavia on the left, and the Spice Warehouses on the right, which is still there as uh, Museum Bahari or the uh, Indonesian Maritime Museum, which many of you would be familiar with. So thank you for the opportunity to speak and thank you uh, for, the, uh, for, the, for your attention and I'll, uh, I'll close today. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Mr. Ian Burnett. I think this is very interesting. Uh, why you really in love with the with the uh, spice uh, spice road journey? Actually, it uh, can see from your book, which is the story about how important the sea journey, and this is uh, very significant in uh, back then, uh, back uh, to the 16th century. And also, I can see that how did Indonesian spice road shape the world map? And this is also very, very significant. So I think we, uh, we're going to uh, start with the question and answer. Uh, so I just open only three questions for this session. So I would love uh, to ask pa, is pa, pa Restu around, pa Restu and Mr. Ian Bar, uh, Burnett to, to answer the question. So uh, is that anyone? I'm going to check on the question and answer. 
Oh, okay. This is from Natalia Halim. Uh, the question for Mr. Ian Burnett, uh, where can we buy the book of the Spice <laughs> Island? Okay, well, uh, if you're in Indonesia, it should be available from the Perry Plus stores Perry. or from Perry Plus online. Mm -hmm. um, if you're in Australia, um, it will be available in a number of bookshops or from the usual online retailers, for example, uh, uh, Amazon mm -hmm. uh, or Booktopia. And if you really want a signed copy, I might be able to send one in the mail. So uh, please contact me through the uh, through the website, Ian Burnett Books. Yes. Okay. So uh, thank you, Mr. Ian. So I think um, uh, we're still waiting. So uh, Rizky, can you help? Is that anyone from the panelists want to ask directly to the speakers? If yes, then we can uh, put up the video for uh, the one who want to ask a question. All right, okay. So um, it's not because of this is not interesting topic. This is really interesting, but maybe everybody just uh, fascinating with all the presentation. Even myself, I. I I seen so many presentation regarding to the Spice Road. As a, as a chief communication officer, I also learn a lot from this program actually. So uh, one question for, uh, for Mr. Ian. So uh, what, what, what actually in your mind, so this is a very popular question, uh, question. So what actually in your mind when you really think to start to write the book? And as an Indonesian, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm really uh, appreciate because you are Australian. So what, what is in your mind when the first time you really want to write? Well, it goes back to when I first came to Indonesia. Um, always been interested in history, so I read as much as I could before I came. And, of course, you know about the Indonesian struggle for independence, the history of the VAC, all those things that uh, you would read. Um, but I only read about the Dutch or only learned about the Dutch. And when I came to Indonesia, through, especially through my wife and a famous Indonesian historian, I, uh, I learned about the Portuguese had been in Indonesia for 100 years before the Dutch. And that was completely new and, and fascinating to me. So I became interested in the, in the Portuguese part of that history, but um, something like 40 years later, uh, after I retired from my professional career, I was interested, I thought I could spend my time writing a book. And of course I knew of these, these fascinating islands that 500 years ago uh, shaped the world economy, shaped the history of the world and, uh, and now, or th then, very few people know where those islands are or their significance. And so I thought, well, that would be a great, uh, a great topic for a book. So that's how I got started doing the research and, uh, and eventually finished the, uh, finished the book. Interesting, interesting. So, um... Actually, uh, I, I also thanks to uh, our chief uh, knowledge officer, which is he's also here, listen to us. Then uh, I would like to uh, give the good news, actually, regarding to our event uh, today, uh, which is uh, the Indonesia-Australia Makassan Connection. It's still alive and it did not end in the 17th century. So that the good news is and still connect us to China as well. So uh, just last week, uh, the, the Spice Road uh, program also discussed about the Makassan Tripang heritage. So again, this is about the, the, the sea connection, the sea space. So we're not talking about the land space more than the, uh, the sea system. So uh, there is a, the, another program, which is uh, we invite also Professor James Fox and uh, Campbell McKnight from the Australian National University. 
So I think uh, we can really uh, do uh, the good program, Pak Heru, because we already start with uh, all the historian and then they, they also have the, the good knowledge uh, to, to contribute in this program. Okay, so I think we have another uh, second session will be with the Pak William Wongso and uh, also uh, Saif Harjo. But before I hand it to the MC, I would like to uh, sum up our uh, first session, which is uh, from these two speakers, we can see that how important the C system is in forming the spice road. So how important the reconstruction of the spice road, not only spice as a commodity, but also this is involved the cross-culture, acculturation, exchange, and connection. So the cultural connection is become the highlight as well. And how, number three is how the stakeholder can work together to support this program, not only to gain the knowledge from the UNESCO as a word, uh, cultural corridor heritage, but also this is important how the impact can be sustained and the universal outstanding value of the Spice Road will give the social, cultural, environmental, and economic value to Indonesia and to the world. From me, thank you very much for Mr. Ian Burnett and also Pak Restu Gunawan. Uh, then I'm Vita Datau. I will uh, give this to the MC. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mrs. Vita Datau, Mr. Ian Burnett, and Pak Restu Gunawan. Uh, it's really an eye opener, I think, for all of us how important that Indonesian spice root uh, and its roles uh, not only in history but also uh, in the future. Uh, the next session won't be less fascinating. We will hear from the experts in the field on how these valuable spices play a significant role in Indonesian cuisine. It is my pleasure to give the screen over to Mr. Arif Adnan, who will facilitate this session. Mr. Adnan is a career diplomat, and before assuming his position as the Deputy Director for Australia and Oceania, he was posted in the Indonesian Embassy in Manila and the Indonesian Permanent Mission in New York. Mr. Atman, the screen is yours. Uh, thank you, Ibu Sari. Uh, can you hear me? Yes, clear. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, good morning, good afternoon um, in uh, Australia. Um, Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to uh, be a part of this uh, important event and um, I have the honor of uh, facilitating two magnificent um, speakers. Uh, I am guided that um, today we, we do have Friday prayers in Indonesia, so uh, perhaps uh, uh, we could uh, go with the 45-minute uh, uh, limit uh, that has been given to me by the organizers. Uh, please allow me to, uh, first of all, introduce uh, Chef uh, William Wongso, otherwise known as the maestro, uh, the Pavarotti of food. Uh, he was born in Malang, East Java and uh, a culinary expert and a graduate of the Sydney Technology uh, College uh, majoring in uh, baking. Uh, he has won numerous awards uh, and we know him as the Diplomat Rendang. And uh, one of the awards is the Medal of Honor from the Académie du Pain Indonésie in Paris. Uh, he is the only Indonesian member of Elite de la Boulangerie Internationale, a very prestigious club of 33 members. Um, Chef Gordon Ramsay uh, also mentored under Chef William Wongso uh, during uh, his trip uh, to West Sumatra to study culture and uh, culinary arts. And it was featured in National Geography. Um, without further ado, uh, Chef William Wongso uh, will be
be the first speaker and he will be talking uh, about uh, what Indonesian spice of the world is and uh, possible inputs and programs to be developed. Without further ado, uh, may I give the screen to Chef William Wongso. Maestro, thank please. you. Thank you, Parif. Thank you, everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, Pak Heru, Pak Hilmar Vita, and Yin for the nice sharing about the knowledge of uh, the history of Indonesian spices. I just like to share on my culinary practitioner experience and uh, point of view for the last 20 years. One thing when you talk about spices, I, I would emphasize that it's misunderstood of the term of spices in Indonesia. Practically, Indonesian cooking or culinary heritage are based on bumbu. And the bumbu is consists of fresh spices like chili, shallot, garlic, ginger, galangal, camferia galangal, uh, candle nut, plus aromatic herbs like lemongrass, coffee lime leaf, um, turmeric leaf, Indonesian bay leaf, plus like a uh, Indonesian basil. On this composition, they are adding some dry spices as what we are talking about is cinnamon, nutmeg, cloves, uh, cumin, coriander, and so forth. Ironically, to my observation, the usage, the heavy usage of dry spices in combined with the, the, the spice base is started from like North Sumatra of Aceh, which is not in the spice island as Molucas. Maybe Ian can discover this because uh, it could be in those days is through the cultural exchange heavily done in the area of Sumatra from spice trade from many from many countries coming to, to Sumatra and they give they share the, the usage of spices like like the spices used uh, in in India. Ate is among the most to my observation combination of dry spices used especially in some part of the of Sumatra. In Java, they are, but it also depends on where it is located. Some area in central Java which have more Arabic descent, they are, tend to use more dry spices to blend with the, the local name called Bumbu. The complexity of this Certainly, I'm pretty sure is through the influence. Also, until today, there's no clue like andaliman or the fresh type of Sichuan pepper used only in Batak or North Sumatra, whether it came from people from China, from Sichuan, or it's mainly original, it could be originated from North Sumatra or Bata soil and brought the seed to Sichuan. That's its only place in Indonesia using this type of uh, 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 spice, which is fresh Sichuan pepper. Have, uh, have uh, numbness, they, they, they always say they have numbness, which is the Javanese can take this numbness on their palate. 
for the last I remember for the last uh, 20 years I've been involved with a lot of Indonesian gastronomy diplomacy I'm from Indonesia I like to introduce and share Indonesian culture the reason why I don't say I'm spreading the Indonesian taste we can whenever you ask anybody when I'm doing uh, this kind of event do you like the food they said we like it the next thing they will ask where's Indonesian restaurant very seldom we find Indonesian restaurant internationally. They are, but not much. Compared to like the Vietnam. Because we take everything for granted. First, there's no proper education, culinary education in Indonesia about Indonesian culinary culture, because we are so diverse. The other thing that people Palette are very individual, very regional. So uh, they sometime in those days, they can travel from one region to the other region. Unlikely now, everybody, because of the social media, they start to call everyone when they're traveling and they want to taste the des designated uh, uh, places, what is the specialty of those places. The, the specialty of that region. So why I always brought Indonesian spice space called Bumbu. I want to show the world the taste of origin of Indonesia in compare, in compare to what type of ingredients available locally. So I show them two aspects. This is the original from Indonesia, everything from Indonesia, it grow in Indonesia. And the other one, it could be somewhere from some Southeast Asia country exported to those places. And the lacking of variety on top of that, also in many cases where when I talk to a lot of Indonesian restaurant owner, they tend to proud of their own recipe, but they never think of the workmanship. The workmanship is very hard. To start a, a, a scratch, the spice space outside of Indonesia is very expensive, is very time consuming. So this is, this is why among the reason a lot of uh, Indonesian restaurant until up to certain point, they got tired. Nobody want to, to, to continue. And also we are shortage of good knowledgeable Indonesian chef. We can check a lot of, uh, Ambassador, before departing to their new post, the most of the depressing issue is to find a good cook. It's not only the cook cook, it's represent Indonesian food culture. Sum up the whole issue for so many, so long. Now is the time we came up with this new program spice up the world why i can guarantee you are lacking of expertise i can guarantee any new investment of indonesian restaurant abroad it would not last long so the program of spice up the world is we train we we introduced application of Indonesian spice space to the local. The initiation of this program is not all over the world, but we start concentrate now to do Africa and Australia. Why Africa? Africa, 
African knows a lot of Indonesian product and they are receptive to any, any uh, spicy taste, any complex taste because they were they cooking, they're only using mostly the dry spices, especially on their rye, which is a barbecue. So it's so easy to give them a new taste profile by adding some of, the, of Indonesian spice paste, variety of spice paste, which consists of some dry spices inside of the paste, depends on the type of the spice paste to apply. Especially during this pandemic, we discover a new method to give a good training through Zoom like this. Before we have to spend a lot of time, we cannot do in one go to many places. We have to sample them traveling and training. But with this, with one condition provided that we start to think the strategy, how to export our spice space into that particular region. As well as Australia, Australia, there are about 70 ethnic migrants. So Australia is among the country who is very receptive to foreign taste. By using Indonesian spice space, we generate economy value for the farmer to grow a good product. To good product. So we can do this export rather than now, mostly the fresh ingredient and not purchase the product exported from Indonesia. So this is, for me, this is aspect is a, is a new opportunity. And on the, on the other hand, if you want to give, share our recipe to other foreign country people, I think it will not work because our recipe is too complex. One has to check one by one all the ingredients they are not familiar with. Now, during this pandemic, even in Indonesia, we start to introduce now a lot of women cooking at home. They never cooked before. Either they buy or they have someone or they have grandmother cooking at home. Now they have to, to prepare food. They can go through Gojek or whatever to order food. But at the time, they get bored by buying. They want healthy food. They have to cook. So now we are introducing in Indonesia is one spice paste that the mindset, one spice paste to many dishes as a home cook or the English, I would say, is cooking with colors. We are introducing three spices, white, red, yellow. And from this, by mix with other elements of ingredients and spices, then we can, everyone can recreate a lot of nice home cooking. And Excuse me, Maestro. Yes. We have three minutes left. Yes, thank, thank you. you. And this is very easy. So when we come back to the spice use, just give you one example. Like in Jambi, the spice, there are a dish called nasi minyak, the fragrant rice. They consist about 10 types of dry spices, whole dry spices, but they are using the method is not grounded, but they make spice tea to cook the rice with other ingredients. And the other, the other use it, Big usage of, uh, of uh, dry spices, also the drink called Sansabil coming from Central Java, Pekalongan, mostly used by the Arabic descent. They make all this plan as a drink by adding ginger, palm sugar, and many other, but totally 15 type of, as a drink. It can be medicinal and it can be refreshed refreshment. Thank you. 
thank you uh, maestro uh, thank you for sharing the experiences and um, we'll try to summarize uh, at the end after our next speaker um, the if if chef william was uh, the pavarotti of food uh, chef harjo maybe the josh groban of uh, the culinary world um, he was born in tanjung pura north sumatra and attended North Sumatra University and uh, also um, studied hospitality management at Sydney Business and Travel Academy. He first opened Medan Chiak restaurant in 2016 with uh, currently two outlets uh, to his name. He is a board member of the Indonesian Restaurant Associations and he is well known for his delicious mooncakes. Um, Chef Haryo, uh, the, the screen is yours. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, good afternoon, everyone. So, uh, I would like to thanks to Pak Haru, all the panelists, uh, Vita, Butsari, Mr. Ayan, Pak William Wongso, and uh, Mr. Arif. Um, before that, I would like to thanks to Mr. William Wongso, which is actually, he is one of my idol. I watched his uh, interview in YouTube like uh, six or seven years ago uh, about asking uh, rendang. So in this uh, four or five episodes, like Mr. We, uh, Pak William Wongso like, explained everything so, like, very clearly. And I learned a lot about rendang at that time. Because, yeah, I will, I will explain later why, why, why I learned a lot from uh, that YouTube channel. Yeah. So uh, I'm Harjo, so, like, uh, it's an honor for me as well for this afternoon to represent like Indonesian restaurant associations to be part of this talk show. Uh, in this talk show, I would like to talk about like uh, the spice of Indonesia, especially uh, connected with the restaurant. When we are talking about the spice, it's definitely related with the restaurant, with the cuisines. As we know, like Indonesia is the largest archipelago in the world, consists of like more than 17,000 islands and about like more than 13,000 ethnic groups, which is like this give huge uh, benefit for Indonesian Korean, uh, cuisines. Uh, every ethnic has a driven uh, cuisines. Yeah, let, let's say uh, rendang. Even just one rendang has a different type, like from each part of Indonesia. Like uh, people from Java, how they cook the rendang is different from Padang or from uh, Malay ethnic or Aceh ethnic. Like uh, Malay ethnic, like uh, in my hometown, they, the way they cooking uh, rendang is just like, it's not as dry as uh, the Padang is one, which is like, it's very, uh, very dry, and dark color in our like Malay ethnic over there it's like more how we say we're not saying that rendang but we say kalio so it's kalio it's just like uh, a, I think a step before rendang so they, they need still cook about one hour or something like that will become like padangis so they have still have more sauce on that kalio yeah uh, talking about like the spice, like connected with the restaurant. Uh, here I will more focus on the restaurant in Australia, especially in New South Wales. As we know, like uh, in New South Wales, there are about like, sixty Indonesian restaurants spread uh, in almost every suburb, which is has Indonesian community. Uh, like. In even in just CBD, Sydney CBD, there are about like almost 12 or 13 Indonesian restaurants, including like uh, the ones like open in a food court with selling Indonesian food. Right. So therefore we can see that like the, the way how we promote Indonesian spice through the restaurant, like for overseas 
or for foreigner is very openly. As long as, as like, <clears throat> as long as like, um, uh, all the spies like from Indonesia, uh, it's like, um, it's connected, uh, and it is freshness and the authenticity of the taste is still as the same as we can get from the Indonesia. Um, Indonesian spice like can be implemented in every kind of our menu, like in a paste, um, in a paste like or mixed with the dry uh, spice like such as like uh, cumin powder or coriander powder. But for my experience, I prefer the coriander powder. Uh, like strictly, we ground it strictly, not more than six hours. Even we put in in a, um, in a tube or in a in a can, like we uh, close it very tightly. After one week, the flavor is less stronger than the fresh one we just ground it. So that's uh, that's my experience, and then like about the Korean coriander and the other thing is like um, the other spice that i would like to emphasize in this case is andaliman as well uh uh pak william wong so as well because i'm from medan like andaliman is very popular in medan now in in not sumatra i think that like, yeah in february last year uh, this year i went back before lockdown in Sydney, I found out Andaliman, they implement, you know, like they put it in many kind of snack food. If when they put it in pizza, when they put Andaliman in pizza, uh, like a uh, kropok, or if when they put it now in like siphon. So normally like they have the pendant siphon, now they have Andaliman siphon. I've, I feel a bit weird about that kind of food, but when I try it, wow. Is something's different, something's nicer, and then something's like I can offer to the overseas uh, or to the foreigner as well. Uh, what I would like to talk about Andaliman as well. I have the experience about this Andaliman. So every time I go back to Medan, I always bring back some Andaliman to Australia. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, so one day I was uh, I was like uh, have a home party with some of my friends, like uh, they are from uh, China and Hong Kong and some from Malaysia. So we have like um, hot pot. So in China, uh, Chinese people, they like the mala, they call it mala tang, so like, like hot pot, Chinese hot pot. They always put like Sichuan pepper in their uh, broth on the, in their soup. So at that time, I told my friend, can you just like uh, skip your uh, Sichuan pepper? I have my Indonesian uh, something similar to Sichuan pepper. I, I don't want to say Andalima is Sichuan pepper because it's a bit different from Sichuan pepper. Uh, so I put it there and then they feel like, wow, totally different. Because in Sichuan pepper, they only can feel about the, uh, how to say like the numbness after eating that one. But for Andalima, you, you not only feel the numbness, but you also feel the, a bit of a, like coffee lime flavor, a bit of coffee lime flavor. That's why like some of my friends, they are very curious, what kind of Sichuan pepper is it? They're asking me. So I say like, this is uh, Indonesian fashion that only grow in uh, Toba, Samosir Island. Yeah. Uh, this is uh, the, uh, the real Andaliman. They have also other Andaliman, but not as uh, the flavor as exactly as the same as the uh, Toba Samosi one, which is like in uh, what I know is from uh, center center of Aceh, Taking one, uh, Taking one. They call it um, they call it Empan, Empan. So Empan is like similar to Andaliman, but not Andaliman, which is I say Empan is more similar to Sichuan paper. Yeah, because they only can feel numbness, but less of uh, the coffee lime flavor. So through this uh, opportunity, I also like I want to to how to say uh, to encourage like all the investor, all the importer 
they have to like are more concerned about like um the spy from indonesia brought to australia because like in australia we always find the spies like it's all made in china it's not no, sorry not in china product of china like cinnamon cloves nutmeg cumin even coriander they always see like product of china which is like sometime or uh, when i say this is like indonesian spice uh, my customer they say this is not uh, indonesian spice this is from china this is china spice and then i have to explain to them about the history like what like uh, mr i am going to say about the how the colonialism and everything everything but in short way to the customer because some of the custom the foreign customer they don't know about this kind of spice if they go to the um, asian supermarket or they go to the uh, go to the supermarket to find the herbs mostly product of china product of china so in their minds that kind of spice is from china it's, it's like it's grow in china which is like actually it's a it's very ironical like it's from indonesia grow in indonesia from indonesia export to china china export again to australia and then we can say that this is a it's a product of china why not like we just like um uh, investor or imported or exported from indonesia like, more export to australia or to overseas like if they can export to china so it means they can also export to other country which is like when if this happen like you know it's a kind of it's a good way to promote our indonesian spice to the world like so in this case like uh, like we are indonesian restaurant like uh, indonesian restaurant association we have one of uh, we have a few importer in sydney such as like eastern cross um sony trading uh what else like golden java as like golden java as now they also bring indonesian fresh uh, no it's a dry korean the whole korean uh, korean shit that's very very good the way i'm using that uh, coriander from indonesia is only like normally i'm only using 100 gram for one recipe uh product of china now I only using about 40 gram of coriander seed that's from Indonesia, which is like, it's the flavor, the quality is totally different. Because of why? Because maybe the freshness and everything. It's not like that. It's also a tumor leaf. Tumor leaf from Indonesia, the flavor is much, much better than tumor leaf from Thailand. Or nutmeg from Indonesia, definitely is the best. And the price is not cheap in here. It's about only 40 grams, 40 grams of nutmeg. It costs us about like uh, $3.20, about $3, 40 grams. So it's actually it's a me, good sir. market. You have three minutes left. Thank you. Actually, it's, it's a, a huge market for all importers or for exporting in Indonesia, you know, to export the uh, spice to other countries such as like in australia as well yeah uh, so yep uh, therefore like uh what i'm sharing about me here uh thank you very much for everyone's so, like yeah thank you for uh bodita thank you busari and thank you Parif. like yeah thank you chef thank you chef Ario, uh for sharing your experiences your analysis uh uh, regarding the situation in uh, Sydney in New South Wales. Um, now we go into the Q&A session. Um, let me check the questions. Uh, okay, I have two questions. Uh, one is for from Ibu Indri Wyburn. Uh, and the second one is to uh, Dudayev. Uh, let me uh, read it out. Question to Pat William. What do you think about Indonesian fusion food? How far can we go? Thank you and best regards. Secondly, uh, perhaps uh, to pa, uh, Chef Ario, is it difficult to get Indonesian spices in Australia? And is there any collaboration between IRA Sydney and importers? 
uh, in Australia to supply the spices to Indonesian restaurants. I think Chef Aryo uh, mentioned a little bit about that, um, but I think these two questions will be our two questions for the Q&A. And yeah. I will give uh, Chef William Maestro uh, an opportunity to uh, uh, go first. Maestro, Thank you. Thank you. Uh, who, who was asking the name of God? Uh, it was Indri. Indri. Oh. Chef. Yes. Okay, Indri. Look, I'm Indonesian. My mission is to, uh, to introduce the authentic flavors of Indonesia. I don't play around. If the result of this introduction to other world turn out to be applied to other method of cooking, that is their problem. My only compromise, especially when I'm traveling, I'm using local fresh product, whatever available. I, to be honest with you, I don't play with uh, fusion, Indonesian, it will create mm -hmm. confusion and at the same time, we'll never introduce our flavors of our heritage. Thank you. Thank you, Chef William. Um, I do apologize for the loud background uh, noise. Uh, there is a mosque right beside uh, my location. Chef Hario, uh, Maybe your comments to uh, for Mr. Uh, Dudayev, uh, perhaps a Russian uh, uh, expert or culinary. Uh... Okay, thank you for the question from Dudaya. Uh, I get some questions about like, is it difficult to get the uh, spice in Australia? Uh, to be honest, like uh, ten years ago or six years ago, it's very, very difficult to get that one. Especially like a coriander shit and everything. Like everything we have uh, have to be from like, uh, Thailand or Vietnam. But the last two years, that, uh, that spice of Indonesia is very easy to find in every Asian supermarket. Not only Indonesian, Indonesian market, Indonesian supermarket, but also every Asian supermarket, like uh, even like a Chinese uh, supermarket, they also have Indonesian spice now. Right. Um, and then about what's the collaboration between uh, uh, IRA and the restaurant uh, and the importer? Um, when we have the problems like about finding the, the spice for our menu, we always, uh, we always like uh, keep in touch, or we are always like, discuss with the importer in uh, Sydney, such as like Eastern Cross, Sony Trading, Golden Jaff, uh, Grand International, and others. Uh, we always explain our problems, and we try. We ask them to help us to get the ingredients that we want for our restaurant. So so far, like uh, the cooperation between Ira and the importer in Sydney are very well. Especially, we are facilitated by the um, uh, Pak Heru, uh, KJRE Sydney. We are, uh, everything's like run very smoothly at the moment. Yeah. Thank you for the questions, uh, Dudaya. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, pa, uh, Chef uh, Hario. Um, yeah. I'm, I'm glad to hear that um, coordination and support uh, from the consulate uh, is being received by uh, IRA. Uh, perhaps you should uh, uh, give a letter of support and recommendation. Uh, that would go a long way uh, for us to <laughs> to also uh, promote the work of uh, the consulate. <laughs> Just a <laughs> friendly <laughs> suggestion. <laughs> okay. No, this is different. this is very it's true. Without Pak Heru, like we don't uh, we don't have uh, Ira or and even Bukvita as well. Bukvita is our leader, so you know. <laughs> She keep push us, she keep telling us and everything. So that's why we have like uh, Ira in Sydney first and maybe next our mission is like uh, in Melbourne. Yeah. And hopefully, grow more and more. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Uh, 
Thank you, Pa uh, Chef uh, William and Chef Hario. Uh, in fact, in in fact, Kemlu uh, uh, as part of a larger discussion facilitated by the Coordinating Ministry for Maritime and Investment to develop programs uh, for 2021 and beyond. Um, Indonesian Spice Up the World is one of uh, three um, main programs. Uh, the other one is uh, gastro diplomacy restaurants and gastronomic destinations. So um, this, uh, the, the results of this uh, talk show will go a long way into providing inputs for uh, us in government uh, to collaborate and develop programs that cater to, to your needs. So, um, Chef Ario, if, if you have inputs um, and suggestions and uh, your wish list of what it could be, your dream, uh, then we'd like to make it happen in 2021 and beyond. And of course, uh, this program is also uh, being chaperoned by the wise uh, maestro, uh, Chef William, and also the guidance of uh, Ms. Fita Datao. Uh, of course, she, she has been uh, in the midst of everything uh, dealing with uh, culinary, gastro di diplomacy, and everything. So uh, we are all trying to uh, play our part to support this endeavor. Uh, with that, I, I do appreciate uh, the questions that have been uh, registered from the from the audience, and also highest appreciation to our two speakers, Chef Maestro William Wongso and uh, Chef. Josh Groba. Oh, sorry, <laughs> Chef, Chef Ario. Um, with you. that, uh, I, I, uh, I will conclude uh, the second uh, discussion session and I give back to Ibu Sari. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Arif Adnan. Uh, Ibu Sari, uh, I was informed before that the Director for East Asia and Pacific Dr. Santo Darmo Sumarto will join us for a closing remarks. But um, I have to confirm first, uh, Pa Arif, is Pa Dir still going to join us? Yes, I believe so. Is he not uh, already joined? I wasn't following. Yeah. Uh, if he's not Mas around, Rizky is there? Pa uh, Santo Darmo Sumarto joining the talk show. He hasn't joined the the, the talk show, Pa uh, Arif. Oh, there there may be some uh, technical difficulties, or he is still in his prior meeting with the minister. So. <laughs> We do apologize okay. uh, and uh, please carry on, uh, Ibu Sari. Okay, thank you, Pak Arif. Uh, we hope to see uh, Pak Di Santo Darmo Sumarto in our next event. And thank you for the support of uh, Pak Santo and the Directorate of East Asia and Pacific of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for this talk show. So, uh, participants, we have come to the end of the talk show. On behalf of the committee, I would like to extend our highest appreciation for all the speakers, moderators, and participants today, as well as the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Ministry of Education and Culture, and Indonesian Association, Indonesian Restaurant Association in Sydney. Thank you for your valuable contribution to the discussion aimed at enriching and supporting our effort in rebuilding the spice route and promoting Indonesia spice up the world. Before closing the talk show, allow me to inform you that the Consulate General of the Republic of Indonesia in Sydney, in cooperation with the Indonesian Embassy in Canberra, Indonesia Gastronomy Network, and the Indonesian Restaurant Association in Sydney, will have a follow-up event on the 30th of November 2020, titled Masterclass on How to Run Indonesian Food Business in Australia. The event, which will be done virtually, will have a list of renowned speakers, namely Chef Ragil Imam Mibowo from Nusa Indonesian Gastronomy, Mrs. Vita Datao from Indonesia Gastronomy Network, 
Chef Harjo from Medan Cia Restaurant in Sydney, and Miss Tasia and Gracia Seger from Makan Restaurant in Melbourne, and winner of My Kitchen Rules 2016. I hope to see you again at this event. In the meantime, stay safe, stay healthy, and always adhere to the health protocol. Subscribe to Budaya Maju YouTube channel and Kajeri Sydney social media and follow us on the Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube. Thank you, everyone, and we will see you again in our next event. Good afternoon Bye -bye. Bye -bye. and good morning. Thank you much. See you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Pak Konjen. Thank you, Ibu Vita.